for the last 25 years, one of my great leading lights, one of my main mentors has been Boyd Haley. Now, you know, it's awful nice if you know what to do for patients. That's, you know, what we do as clinicians. But Dr. Haley, as Chair Emeritus of Chemistry at Kentucky, not only knows what to do, he provides us the tools. I mean, he has lectured uh, in in so many ICIM meetings about you know reactive toxic species and and how you do chelation for toxic metals and all this stuff. I mean, he's got the big picture. If you find anything on the internet written by Boyd Haley, it's true. If you find anything written about him, it depends on whether it's good or bad. If it's good, it's true. If it's bad, the bastards just want to shut him down. <laughs> okay. So just remember that, because he speaks sooth. I am honored, once again, to introduce my friend, Boyd Haley. I have a disclaimer to read. I do. Uh, most of you know I am uh, uh, the founder and principal stockholder of a company called Amerimed. It used to be called CTI Science. And we're developing a chelator, which we'll talk about today. It's a true chelator. And, uh, and I do have financial interest in it. It's cost me a lot of money so far. <laughs> uh, but we're making good progress. And I, I would uh, happily answer any questions. There are certain things I can't say. Uh, because the FDA will say I'm marketing a drug without it being authorized yet. So, but I'll, I'll answer any questions you give me aside where I don't have a big microphone and the film on me and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> okay. Okay, what we're talking about today is something that I agreed on a long time ago was to talk about a comparison of av available heavy metal chelators. And uh, you can read this. Uh, uh, on <laughs> Evidently I can't because it's too small. Uh, but in here it says this is from uh, an editorial on the state of art of treatment of metal toxicity. And it says in recent years it has become more clear. Can I get somebody to adjust this picture up here so I can read it? I mean, if I start. Uh, Don't touch it. <laughs> Just make That's it. it. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can do something here. Just make them bigger. Yeah. Um, it's going to be under the view. Here comes. Here comes the expert. Yeah. Somebody who knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Slice uh, it. Why don't we do it this way? Would you? You just can look at your slide like it is up there. It'd be the best way to close. Yeah, that would be the way. I'd like to do it. Okay. So let's. Just and just get. It. Yeah. You can use slide shut. You took it away from me. Just, you just relax for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm having troubles. Mm -hmm. I'm getting anxious. Don't be anxious. I am. Oh, you're marrying him. Okay. Maybe, maybe. Maybe now. You're there. No. Nope. Well, you're there. There. I'll push him up there. You have to use your slideshow in here. Interviews can give him the just notes as well. You just want slideshow. Right. Down here or no? No. Uh, okay, let's try this. Maybe I can make it bigger. Hush! 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 I will talk to you while you're doing it. What this first slide says is that medicine has finally agreed that exposures of humans to heavy metals is causing medical problems. 
That was in 2009, I think, is when that slide came up. And they, what they say also on this is that we can just get big government, big industry, etc., to get together. We could probably make better chelators because the chelators we're using today don't work. And that was going to be the introduction of my slide. And you can, it's on the, the thing, you can read it. Uh, but what I'm telling you, what you're going to look at today is something that the FDA does, did not approve of. Uh, it was done by a small research group at the University of Kentucky and then started working with people uh, at the IAOMT, IABDM, ICM, and AAEM, or someone involved. But it's, uh, we, have, we have come up with what they're saying we need to spend billions of dollars to get it done. Uh, we have spent a lot of my money and, and a lot of investors' money. A lot of people from the IAOMT, primarily Rich Fisher, David Kennedy, uh, Tom Holpitz, and people like that have contributed, bought stock in my company to allow me to get over the hump. And we made it through, with their help, the Valley of Death. The Valley of Death is before you ever get uh, a chance to do phase one. We've done phase one with this. We'll talk about it. And I'll, I'll go over a lot of this real fast later on. But the compound has absolutely no toxic side effects, no matter what anyone says. And if you remember when this was OSR, it was the call celeb of the neurodiversity group to say that I was poisoning uh, young children with uh, an industrial chemical. Uh, I don't know where they came from up with that, but we've proven that that's not true. This compound is totally safe. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, I can... Uh, so I'm not going to beat on this anymore, but if you look at the second part of that, it said it's in recent years, this was in uh, 2014. Now this is going to come as a surprise to all you people. It's become more and more clear that metal intoxication represents a worldwide major health problem. Uh, when I first came into this, I remember my first interactions with David Kennedy was mercury from your amalgams makes you sick. And I thought, this is a crazy man. He is crazy, but that's not what us beyond. <laughs> He's also a good friend, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I, I thought the FDA wouldn't let that happen. Simple. I mean, I'm, I'm a patriot type. I believe in the FDA and the CDC. I listened to everything they said and thought, the hell, they wouldn't lie to me. Why would they? I, I can give you a whole list of reasons now why they would and why they have. But, but it says here, a joint effort of chemical, biochemical, pathological, and clinical researchers might be adequate to, might be adequate to solve a metal-related clinical health international, uh, me medical clinical problem in healthcare. Supported by large investments, I didn't change that, did I? <laughs> by central governments and inter international health organizations. I want to tell you, if you wait on the people I just listed, you're never going to get it done. You're never going to get it done. These people basically lack basic honesty and basic forthrightness. Uh, and so what I'm saying, and I want to thank the people who have supported me over the years with the development of this compound, because when you're my age, you really don't give a rat's or end about money. I'm not going to buy a sports car or even a better boat. I have a fishing pontoon. That's all I want. <laughs> but right now I'm going, to, I'm going to try and give you, summarize a lot of this, and I'm going to go through the first part of this very fast to get up with it. But this cartoon here tells you the whole problem. And this is something that a biochemist who really has nothing to do with medical metal toxicity coming in and listening to all this stuff. Over several years, by the way, what you see here, if you look at this, you see where the mercury vapor. Mercury vapor can go everywhere in your body. It's totally non-reactive, totally non-toxic. It's like a hand grenade that hasn't had the pin pull on it yet. It goes through and it gets wherever it wants. It can get into the most inter aspects of your body, including into your mitochondria, as I have on this the cartoon here. And while in the, while going to the mitochondria or after it's in the mitochondria, it can be hit by certain enzymes like catalase, and you have this non-toxic, non-reactive mercury that's converted to HG2+, that wrecks havoc on your entire body. And how it does this is really quite remarkable. When they say, and you look at me, they say iron causes this problem, or copper. Uh, Dr. Levy gave a beautiful seminar today, and he talked about oxidative stress being the cause of all, almost all illnesses. And I, I mean, I, as a scientist, I never say ne always and never say never. But 
oxidative stress, I would just welcome you to go to Google and type in your favorite disease and then after that add in oxidative stress and see how many hits you get. If it's a major disease, you can bet you're going to see a lot of papers on oxidative stress associated with different diseases. Now, what you have to understand, mercury cannot make superoxide anion or any of these things. Mercury does not exchange electrons. What mercury does when it gets into the Hg2 plus form, it makes common sense. It binds the thiol groups tighter than anything else. So if you have thiol groups in your copper binding sites, your iron binding sites, then Hg2 plus goes in and displaces it. It inhibits that enzyme system and it frees copper and iron. Copper and iron are what we call redox metals. In other words, they can exchange uh, electrons and go back and forth between copper 1 to copper 2 and cycle and get into a catalytic action. Iron 2 to iron 3 does the same thing. And it's called a Fenton reaction if you're making hydroxy free radicals. And so that's how you get the catalytic production of hydroxy free radicals and the oxidative stress. So Dr. Levy was exactly on mark, but I would tell you, you have to say, if you're getting oxidative stress, how does that happen chemically? You have to have free copper or free iron or a free redox metal. And the only way you get that, it can't come into your body you don't have copper get into your body and go floating around your blood. Copper and iron are always sequestered by a protein to keep it from participating in the Fenton reaction and making hydroxy free radicals. If you have free iron in your body, you're sick. And so we'll go through it. Now, that's the problem. We've got mercury coming in and releasing copper and iron and every tissue it goes into causing oxidative stress. And so we're going to try and treat that. And if you look at the EDTA, DMPS, and DMSA, I got a big X there because they don't work. They don't cross the membrane very effectively. They do cross, you can say, well, a little bit gets in there, but nothing like this required. And so the real problem with EDTA, DMPS, and DMSA is it doesn't get inside the cells. I mean, for example, the half-life, if you do a DMPS challenge test, it's bound to mercury in your blood and out in your urine in less than three hours, most of it. So it's rapidly excreted. It now it doesn't get inside your cells. So we, the, the kidney clears it very fast. And I think the same same thing with DMPS or DMSA and EDTA. It doesn't mean they don't work. And I'll show you the data. They take, they'll drop the mercury level in your blood about 25% within the first two or three hours. And then six hours later, it'll be right back where it was. The using DMPS and DMSA, they work, and, they, and I'm not criticizing anybody that's ever used them because it's the best tool you've had. But what it is, it's like emptying a 50-gallon barrel with a tablespoon. I mean, it's just too slow. Because you'll see in the study that we're going to present and what we found in our own research is that DMPS is not effective at reducing the entire mercury body burden. It's the best thing you have, but it just doesn't work. And that's the reason chelation has such a bad reputation. It has a bad reputation, they'll tell you that. Medical doctors don't like it at all. And why not? Because the stuff you've been using can make you sick and can kill you. I mean, chelators are very dangerous if they're not used properly. And so we talk about this. This is one of the things that we're going to talk about in the, uh, in the, the presentation. And then we contrast it to methylmercury from fish and ethylmercury from the, uh, uh, the marisol and the vaccine and you understand that ethyl mercury binds chloride very tightly you have a lot of chloride in your blood and when you do that you make a neutral compound that's shown at the reaction on the top right and it goes right through the membrane ethyl mercury goes into the mitochondria and into the membrane this work has been done by several physicians several medical groups it's very toxic it gets inside and then it penetrates and it concentrates fivefold in the cytosol of a cell according to Sharp et al. It's on this thing here and it, con it concentrates a thousandfold in the mitochondria. And when you talk about autistic children or people with other diseases, what's the one thing they always allude to? You have mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, hell yes. I mean, you're piling it in there. Why does it concentrate in the mitochondria? You have the iron sulfur centers in the mitochondria, you have tons of thiol groups surrounding the mitochondria and within it in the electron transport system and elsewhere. Mercury goes there because that's where the thiols are. It's just chemistry. It concentrates there because it can react. And then we're going to talk about the effect on the mitochondria a bit. Um, so uh, th these are important considerations for treating heavy metal toxicity. And we're going to get to, uh, go through these one at a time. 
you have to understand that if you're going to stop mercury toxicity, where do you have to go? You have to go inside the cell. And the chelators that are charged do not effectively do that, so they don't, they don't get in where the toxicity is occurring. So how are they doing? You can take all the mercury you want out of the blood, and if it's still located inside your liver cells, your liver is going to have problems, and your kidney also. So that is one thing you have to do. So it's imperative that the treatment compound be able to pass through the lipid bilayer, bilayer and enter the cell to be most effective. And the compound has to have a half-life. I mean, half-life is how long does it take for your body to get rid of half of whatever you just took in, either by IV or by uh, taking out a capsule. DMPS and DMSA and EDTA all have very short half-lives because they stay in the blood, they don't get in the cells, they get cleared by the kidney. In the case of DMPS, the half-life is somewhat uh, less than three hours. That's the reason they have you collect a four-hour urine if you take it, because as it goes out, it carries out uh, mercury but it also carries out zinc and copper and other essential metals. So uh, something like OSR, where does it go? It goes into the fatty tissue. It goes into the hydrophobic aspects of your body. It gets inside every cell of every tissue we've ever tested. And that's easy. Uh, and that's what, this was done by third-party groups that are very effective at this. And so you have a 22-hour half-life about of the first capsule in, in MBMI or Amerimex, as we now have to call it. When it gets in your body, it takes 22 hours for half of it to be gone. So you have a long time for it to sit in there and collect mercury and bind mercury that's rotating through your body. <clears throat> and it's important that this compound have an exceptionally tight half-life. Now this is what the people who use DMPS and DMSA for treatment are going to be upset about. They're not chelators. And we're going to show you the data that they're not chelators. They form sandwich complexes, and they can lose one half of that and be exchanged off for, say, a more reactive thiol protein in the kidney. And if you're not careful, when you give DMPS to somebody that's mercury toxic, they will get the mercury out of the liver and out of the body, and they'll concentrate in their kidneys, and they'll have kidney failure. So you've got to be very careful. The compound we're going to talk about today, and can contrast this, when it binds mercury, it turns into a non-reactive compound that you cannot dissolve if you isolate it. It's easy to isolate because it precipitates out of water. You can't dissolve it in anything without destroying the chemical structure. It makes a totally inert, non-reactive, non-toxic compound that's taken out of your body through the P450 system. The P450 system is a detox system that's used to get things like chloroform or benzene out of your body. Not chloroform, benzene. It, it puts a sulfate group on it. And so it, it goes in, and that's how we get rid of uh, NBMI that has mercury bound. It, uh, it's uh, converted to the hydroxyl group on the benzene ring, and that benzene ring gets something like glutathione or something attached to it that makes it water soluble, and it goes out. <clears throat> and it says the treatment compound should not dramatically affect the level of essential metals. All of you know the DMPS and DMSA and EDTA will deplete your body of zinc, copper, and any other metal that's floating around the bloodstream. NBMI does not do that. In contrast, if you have high uh, calcium and you want to get your calcium down, NBMI doesn't have a, a bit of attraction or any way to deplete calcium. It just doesn't do it. It has no attraction for it at all. So there are different problems you used, would use different chelators for. NBMI will only bind metals that have high affinity for thiol groups, which are the most toxic metals, because that's how the toxicity exists, by reacting with specific thiols. So, uh, and we said it's critical that the compound has a mode to exit the body. NBMI does not go out through the urine. It goes out through the feces, and it goes out as a, a, P450, a P450 modified compound. And it said that the next thing for the treatment of mercury toxicity, as I told you, Mercury elicits its toxicity primarily by displacing iron and copper, and when you have free iron and copper that are displaced by mercury, you generate the hydroxy radical uh, or the oxidative stress. So wouldn't it be nice to have a compound that is capable of binding copper, iron, and mercury? And that's what NBMI does. It binds more than that. It's really very potent. We found it removing uranium. So if any of you are uranium toxic and you have enough that will make we can sell it, if we purify it, let me know. Okay. The other thing is the stability of the compound. You will find out, and from the research I'm going to show you, that DMPS, DMSA oxidize very rapidly. EDTA doesn't have an oxidation uh, problem. 
it's a very stable compound also. But we have found that the half-life of uh, NBMI is five years in growing. So, I mean, we can claim the five years because it's been tested by people uh, heating it to 75 degrees, etc. So you have something here uh, that is very stable and it's going to go on. So let's now go into this and I'm going to go through some of this pretty fast because I think it'll be boring to a lot of you. But what we're going to do, we're going to talk about compounds with thio groups on adjacent carbons. And why this is important, this is DMPS, DMSA, British anti-leucide agent, and several other compounds. And what this is, to visually send it, you have two arms that are locked like this. And mercury is this big. It can't get in between those two arms. You do not form a true thiol with two, sulfur, two bonds from one DMPS molecule to uh, mercury. Can't be done. There isn't enough room. It's steric, steric chemistry. Can't be done. We'll show you the research on that. And so we're going to compare those compounds, and then we're going to talk about the charged compounds. If a compound is charged, initially at physiological pH, it's not going to get inside a cell. That's how your cells are made. That's when you have a lipid bilayer. It just doesn't happen. So it's not going to get in to where the mercury is doing the uh, uh, enzyme. And we're going to talk about some compounds that are uncharged and lipophilic, like British anti-leucide agent and NBMI, or Erminex. Now, in that one line, what these compounds both do is they get in the body. Bowel, British anti-leucide agent, is not used as a chelator anymore because it kills you. It's, got a, it's very lethal if you don't use it exactly right. NBMI, I mean, you could take a rat and pour a pound on him and then make him eat his way out of it and it wouldn't hurt him. So, okay, we're going to talk about these compounds and we're going to say they're not uh, uh, with compounds with sulfides on the adjacent carbons. And here's the structure of them. And they look clever. And I know when I first came in, I saw them, they would draw it with two bonds to the uh, mercury, one mercury atom, and that doesn't happen. And these are analogs of British anti lucid light agent. They're water soluble and lower in toxicity than BAL, and they were effectively used. And then, then the down below that, this is from a, a paper by Dr. Vazipotion. BAL and DMPA are too toxic for general used. They are uncharged at physiological pH, they get inside. So getting inside isn't enough, you've got to get inside and be non-toxic. And so here's some papers, it's a paper, and by the way, on these papers, I, this is just to give you an idea that I do read science, all this is based on papers I've read and or some of them I've published, but uh, if you read the red, it'll tell you, it'll summarize the whole thing, because I don't think any of you have eyes good enough to read that uh, from the distance you're sitting. <clears throat> but voltmetric analysis in 2009, they showed that the Padrama species were HG2, DMSA2, HG2, DMPS2, and HG penicillin. Penicillin only has one sulfur group on it, uh, penicillin 2. Uh, so this really showed initially that DMPS and DMSA do not form one-to-one -one complexes. And this is a paper that really is the critical one. It's a study showing DMPA and DMSA do not form a true chelate with mercury. And why this is important, chelates are very stable. Usually if you chelate something enough to render it and take it out of solution, it is not going to react. DMPS and DMSA do not do that. And he has a point down on the lower right, you see a, a structure that they do, and that structure just is totally incorrect. Now, for those of you that are very visual, I put this up here. Two items. Glutathione binds mercury in a sandwich complex. You don't have one glutathione molecule bind mercury and move it. It makes a mercury diglutathione complex and it's carried out of the body because there, there are receptors inside the cell and in the liver that have high attraction and high affinity for glutathione. Glutathione marks whatever it binds to for excretion. It goes out through the biliary transport into the feces. And I, I just wanted to point that out to you because if you look at our compound later on, you'll see it looks like two glutathione molecules hanging off of a benzene ring. Pretty damn close to that, actually. And so it can uh, form uh, the dimer, which is uh, very effective at binding it. And now if you look at the second, the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that I got mercury labeled there and two thiol groups. Look how much bigger that mercury is in the ionic space, space filling model versus the two sulfurs. Now try and put that in between two thiol groups on adjacent carbons. It just tells you it can't work. It just will not work. And so what, what, pardon me, what we're
we're saying here is that that right hand structure never ever existed. It can't exist. So it must be linear. And uh, But I want to stop a second and say this does not mean that DMPS and DMSA do not work. They take the mercury out of your blood and they put it in the urine and you excrete it. The problem is it's they, what they move, even though it looks big when you look on a doctor's data thing, or, or how much is in there, it's not very big, not compared to how much is in your body. You will replenish it time after time after time. Like I said, it's like emptying a 50-gallon barrel with a teaspoon. And this is the, 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 the structures that uh, George found in 2004 with the uh, mercury, the major structures, and you see most of them are sandwich kind type complexes with the mercury bound in between two DMPS or DMSA molecules. Okay, now we talk, talk about forming ox, uh, disulfides. This is from Dr. Vazipozian's work and what they showed that this DMPS will actually form a complex, a disulfide complex with cysteine. It will remove cysteine from your blood. When it binds to cysteine, it's not, it's not a natural compound anymore, so it gets excreted in the urine. What is cysteine used for? Cysteine is the rate-limiting rate amino acid for a huge number of proteins being synthesized, but primarily glutathione. If you take cysteine out of the bloodstream, that person will not make glutathione, and he's going to suffer from oxidative stress and the inability to do a lot of good things that glutathione is the catalyst or the major cofactor for. So another bad thing about DMPS and DMSA, they form mixed disulfides. They take compounds out of your body you shouldn't get out of your body, like cysteine, lipoic acid. We want to go on. But anyway, so, and this is an oxidation step. I can tell you, we have never seen, we have tried in the test tube to get NBMI to form a disulfide. It just will not do it. It just will not do it. Now, something to do with the structure of that compound and the benzene ring involved. It does not oxidize and doesn't form disulfides, not very easily. You have to use some tricks to get it done. This is just a comp, I don't want to talk about that so much because I haven't got that much time. So, so we say DMPS forms by sulfide lead dimers and methyl sulfur compounds in the urine. This is from Dr. Vaz Apotion's lab. Dr. Apotion has spoke to the, spoken to many of you many times. He's a was an eminent scientist. I think he's, he's retired now for several years, but he did really good work. And he, he pointed out some of his stuff. But you can understand, if you're going to put something in your body to chelate mercury, you don't want it forming other compounds, polymers. You just don't want that happening. It's not effective. And so here's the structure of the compounds. Now we're talking about the, uh, the chelator showing acidic groups that form negative charges on the loss of protons at physiological pH. And you have DMSA, DMPS, bowel doesn't do it, bowel goes right into your cells, and EDTA. And by the way, I am not anti-EDTA. I think EDTA is a great compound. It's got to be used in the right for the right problems in the right way. And I, I'm not an expert on the use of it, but I, I can see why I think it's been a blessing to him mankind to have this compound on. So don't think I'm saying EDTA is a bad compound. It's got problems. But so I think about every compound. So here you see EDTA makes uh, four negative charges. How does it get inside your cells to bind lead and get it out? Very tough to do. It does translocate, and there were publications. I know I gave the talks the first time to the IAOMT or to ACAM or somebody like that, and we talked about lead uh, chelating uh, mercury and probably lead with the EDTA and how it translocated. The first two chelations would take it from the body and deliver a lot of it to the brain. When you got to the third chelation, it took it out of the brain. So it, you know, it binds stuff and it moves it around so that if you know what you're doing with it, you can get good results, but you've got to be very careful. Uh, but EDTA is not going to be talked about much in our uh, study because EDTA, and I don't know who believes it or who says it, if you think EDTA binds mercury and takes it out of the body, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know any chemistry. EDTA binds mercury very tightly if you have it in there alone, but it will not pull mercury off of a thiol group. It just won't do it. Not, not under physiological conditions or any treatment conditions. Okay. The other thing we talked about, the compounds, they have to be non-toxic. And here we have the table of LD50, the lethal dose that will kill 50% of the animals of the different chelators that we're talking about today. And you see they all have a value. And uh, some of them, the ones that are the most uh, soluble, we get into cells, most are the ones that are the most toxic. So uh, 
for comparison. In other words, if you can get an LD50 value, that tells you you have a lethal dose that you can determine. With NBMI, we can't determine a lethal dose. If we give five grams per kilogram body weight to a rat, he lives. And then he might, he might get a runny nose or he might get a bit of diarrhea or something like that, but he doesn't die. We can't kill him with this stuff. We give it to him multiple times, doses in a day, to get it in under their stomach. And the only way you can kill them is if you clog up their stomach by giving them too much of it that they can't get it out. So here we have a compound that there's just absolutely no contest. I mean, the lethality of these chelators is very determinable in rats, and I think it could be determinable in humans if we could get the proper volunteers, but we can't. So anyway, that, that's the thing. Okay. <clears throat> Chelation and metal intoxication. Uh, this study, uh, you can read it there, and these are all available, by the way. I don't keep my slides away from anybody. Anybody wants my slides, if you can pay the IOMT to transfer them to you, you're welcome to them. Uh, but this study showed that DMSA effectively removes mercury from blood, but not, does not access the intracellular mercury very well, if at all. It just doesn't do it. You've got to get in there and it doesn't do it. And this is a major study published in, in Journal of Environmental Health and Public Research. So, um, uh, this is the one that you have to listen to carefully. It's the Mount Dawada study on Philippines. This is what we're having to do now. We're taking NBMI to mercury toxic miners in Ecuador. And you measure the mercury in their urine and their blood and everywhere else before you start. And then you treat them with the compound for two weeks. And then you check it and you'll get to see the data in just a little bit. In this study here, it says uh, <clears throat> these people were uh, to be mercury toxic, were orally treated with two times 200 milligrams of the chelating agent DMPS from Dimaval, Heil, Germany, for 14 days in the course of a UN UNO study. The bottom line of this, uh, uh, they found that they saw elevated mercury being excreted in the, in the urine. That's the DMPS challenge test. It says, nevertheless, in most cases, the blood and mercury in urine was not markedly decreased by the treatment. This shows that the duration of the treatment, which they did 14 days, was not sufficient for a permanent decrease in mercury. As DMPS excretes mercury mainly through the kidney, it can be concluded in most cases, even after 14 days of treatment, there was an ongoing redistribution of mercury from other tissues into the kidney. So you can treat it, it's like I say, it's like emptying a, a 50 gallon barrel with a, a teaspoon. And if you look at the data, here's the data where they talk about, if you see the first red arrow on the left, it's the mercury blood before the MPS. The arrow to the right of that showed that before they treated them all, it went, it was 19.8 down to 22.1. And then after 14 days, it went from, it went uh, down to 16 and 20. 1.8. It wasn't significantly different. In other words, you treat these patients, you get what looks like a good result, increased urinary mercury, but the amount in the blood and in the body hasn't changed at all. This is the, the level of the basis of the DMPS challenge test using urinary mercury levels. And the reason this is important, this is what the EMA, <coughs> we're hitting a nerve on me now, so I might stutter a little bit. They're saying I have to compare my compound to DMPS as uh, the standard of care. DMPS has never made FDA or EMA approval. It's never gone through this at all. So I'm having to prove that my compound, by going through the FDA and the EMA guidelines, mainly EMA, this is EMA, not the FDA, uh, that my compound works better than a compound that's not approved for use in most of Europe. It's approved in one country, and that's the company that where it originated, and that's Germany. And so, uh, but when you give DMPS, like if you look at this thing here, the bottom line is the, the micrograms of mercury per gram of creatine without DMPS, and then the higher level if, uh, is the ones after you put DMPS. DMPS does cause a dramatic increase in excretion, but it's going from inf infinitesimal to just double infinitesimal, or triple infinitesimal, or 10 times infinitesimal. It's not taking out a lot of mercury, not, a, not relative to the amount that's in your body. But we will be using this DMPS test because in our next study, which will be done on mercury toxic miners in Ecuador, we have to take them through a whole DM, uh, uh, one arm of the people has to be DMPS treated only, and one arm has to be NBMI or Marimex treated only, and then at the end we have to give them the DMPS test. Now the difference is, and we're happy with that, 
That's great for us because it's not going. We know, we've seen the results. What happens with the NPS? It won't block change it at all. But MBMI works this way. It goes into your body. It immediately binds mercury and renders that mercury non-toxic. It doesn't take it out of the body. It sits there inert and, and it gets slowly removed by the P450 system. But while it's bound to NBMI, it has no reactivity and no toxicity. And we've shown that. We'll, we'll give you the, some of the data on what happens to the liver and the kidney with the mercury treatment, allowing it to go so far and then putting in NBMI for another 10 days and see what, hap what, what is the structure and what is the health of the kidneys of those animals. And what you'll see is that NBMI causes it, allows the kidneys to repair totally. Whereas if you don't give it to them, the kidneys stay non-functional. So this is a conclusion from uh, their paper. It says, in most cases, even the forced mercury excretion with a high dose of 400 milligrams a day for 14 days did not result in a marked reduction of the mercury concentration in the blood, and et cetera, et cetera. This is another paper by Dr. Oposian, and this is another reason why you should uh, look at our compound. DMPS in the bloodstream is primarily bound to a thiol group on albumin. And you can look at this, the double structure you see where the two curves are going. One is the total, the top one's the total. The one slightly below that is the amount that's protein bound. So DMPS and DMSA bind to albumin, and they're not free-floating molecules, and that's, not, that's exactly what you wouldn't want. And this also indicates that this compounds could be inhibitory to other enzymes. Uh, this is a, a, a study that has been known for some time that urine mercury levels do not reflect the toxicity of the subject that the subject is experiencing. The amount of mercury in your urine is more dependent upon how good of an excreter you are. It has nothing to do with how much you've been exposed. People that have been involved in medication know this. Yet. Talking to the European Medicines Agency, talking to the FDA, you have to say you're only mercury toxic if your urine mercury levels reach a certain level. And you may just may be a good excreter. And if you're not a good excreter and you've been exposed to mercury and your mercury levels are low because you can't get rid of it, you're just SOL. And it's stupid. And you try and talk to them about it. it they, they, it's like, we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear. Because what can we can't do anything if we can't say... They're toxic because of the amount in their urine, an easy biopsy or the blood. But that's the fact. The fact is if it goes into your cells and it stays there and it doesn't get out into your blood, it's not going to be excreted. And this has been known for some time. Uh, this was published in 1995. And there are several studies like this. I mean, the first one I read was on a, a factory where they had this conundrum. This whole factory, uh, a chloralkali plant, had an exposure to mercury. And what they found, they said, we, this was the exposure level was all determined by the mercury in their urine and their blood. And they had this conundrum. The people that were the most exposed got better, faster, and had less severe problems than the people that, I mean, they were all exposed in the same factory. But the people with, the, they said, less exposed because they didn't have as much in their urine and blood, they weren't excreting it, uh, were the ones that suffered. Okay. And this, that's exactly what this, this is another article says that urinary levels do not necessarily correlate with the severity of mercury toxicity. Therefore, the implication by medical authorities that urinary levels have to reach a defined level before one is considered mercury, mercury toxic is invalid. Yet this is highly practiced by medicine. I don't know about European medicine. I haven't been there. But I can tell you, I, I know a lot of American doctors. They call me up and call me names. So I get to talk to them. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, they're the dumbest group biochemically and biologically and physiologically of any group of people I've ever met. I mean, you know, there's this old saying my, my dad used to like to tell me when I was going to college. You know, you educate a fool, you just have an educated fool. <laughs> and I, I think we're running into that. And these people all go into political science. They go, I mean, they all get into politics and go become government uh, regulatory agents, I think. So. Okay. <clears throat> uh, here's another one uh, that w talks about uh, the unpredicted toxic effects of DMPS and N-acetylcysteine on mercury toxic mines. This is nothing more than these chelators taking mercury from concentrated areas and delivering it to the most reactive files in the kidney. And so it's, it's really not rocket science, but it's, it's been well established and somebody had to do the experiment to convince the idiots, and they did. Uh, 
this is a, we've already gone over online. It's effective at removing both mercury and methyl mercury. I will tell you this. The uh, dithyl chelators, DMPS and DMSA, will bind to methyl mercury. They'll reduce its toxicity, there's no doubt about it. And so does our compound. That's not rocket science. But in this paper here, they said they were unable to effectively reduce mercury in the blood and brain, even though they bound both of these compounds. They did not help the body at all. So, you know, you're spending a lot of money, you're doing the best you can do, and I hope that nobody takes offense at me saying this, because of you guys where I learned this. Uh, This is a, just another statement, uh, another paper, uh, a little overkill, and I'm, out of, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to be able to discuss it. But both DMPS and DMSA do remove mercury from the blood via the kidney filtration, with DMPS being the most effective. What uh, must be considered is the replacement of blood mercury with the much higher levels of intracellular body burden of mercury. And there's almost no way we can tell you how mercury toxic you are, how much you've kept correct. I mean, if you bring in a, a, an 18-year-old with five amalgam fillings and you compare him to a 78-year-old with five amalgam fillings, who do you think is going to have the highest mercury level? The old guy. And, and that's shown. With the NHAN study, they've done studies like this, and they've shown that you almost find no mercury in the, in the people up to about age 18, but after 18, it starts going up, and the older you get, the higher it rises. The older we get, the lower our glutathione levels go, and the less capable we are of excreting mercury. Now, here's a good positive people. Uh, paper, the placenta, and I have no objections to what they said here. And they said that DMPS and DMSA reduce fetal and placental mercury level uh, uh, mercury levels, and that's good. I was surprised to read this. I was surprised I got that result. Uh, that was done in 2009, and I haven't seen any follow up on this. Uh, but it does tell you there are reasons out there for people to use this. So people who do DMPS uh, treatments are not totally off base. They do have some data that supports them, but it's slow, very slow. Um, <clears throat> this next one is about the depletion of essential metals. And I'll tell you up front, NBMI does not deplete any essential metals, even in the slightest little bit, in all of the studies we've done on rats, mice, cats, dogs, guinea pigs, mini pigs, and the rabbits. It just doesn't do it. It just has no attraction for them. If you look at the chemistry and you understand the chemistry, it just is not going to bind these things. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to go real fast now. This is another thing on that. I just got I just got a warning here. I got to get out of here. Okay. Okay. This is the compound we're going to talk about. This compound I sold it as a dietary antioxidant called OSR, and it had. We sold it for over two years, over three million packages. We never had a single adverse effect report to, reported to our adverse effect reporting system. The FDA never had an adverse effect. And they said, I can't call this a dietary antioxidant. And primarily why? Because some mothers who were ecstatic about the fact that it helped their children with autism or neurological problems put it on their blog sites that this was the best treatment for autistic children that they had seen. It stops the gut dysbiosis. We can, uh, we've shown that data earlier. It actually prevents mercury or thimerosal or methylmercury from causing a leaky gut syndrome. It stops it. Just, you know, you take that, it, it stops it. And this compound is made out of 1,3-dicarboxybenzoate, which is found in cinnamon and is considered a very healthy antioxidizing material. It's in the Cokes and the beer you drink. It's an antioxidant. And attach, I, I attach to that two cystamines, uh, which is nothing more than cysteine with the CO2 group off. And the reason you do this is so you can have these thyroid groups like my two hands out here. Because if you want to bind mercury, you have to hit it at a 180 degree angle. If you want to bind iron, the coordination chemistry is different. You come in at angles. Every metal has coordination chemistry that's slightly different than the other metals. And so if you're going to have something that picks up a lot of different toxic metals like uranium, lead, uh, iron, free iron, etc., you've got to have something that has adjustable thiol groups. And if you have them all on the same thing, and if you look at those two arms, they'll look very similar to the arms that come out on glutathione. That's the reason cystamine was picked. So this compound was made out of two, uh, if you break the structure down, it's two natural products, but it... It was effective at treating a disease, and our FDA has a stand. If you have something that treats a disease, it can't be a food. It has to be a um, has to be a drug.
And here's the safety of benzoates in our medical application. I just want to read one of them. Sodium benzoate in metabolite of cinnamon and a food additive upregulates neuroprotective Parkinson's disease protein DJ1 and astrocytes. And that's the compound. That's an additive benefit in our compound because they're not toxic. And these are all here. You can pick them up and read them all, uh, but they usually show that. And this is a stick structure. And I'll tell you, it's critical if you're a scientist or looking at this, that you have the degrees of freedom of rotation of these thiol groups, which you see in yellow here, that they can move around at different angles and different distances and bind metals, form uh, two bonds with metals and hold them in a chelate. And that's the simple aspect of this compound. And like we're saying here on the left, mercury can bind in between NBMI. If you put mercury in water, mercury chloride, and add NBMI dissolved in DMSO or methanol on that water, you'll see a cloudy white precipitate form. And down will come a mercury DMPS complex, as we're showing here, and you can't dissolve it in anything. I have tried every organic chemical in my laboratory to do this, and it just will not be dissolved. And to get it out of the body where I have that red arrow, the P450 site, like it does to get rid of benzene, will oxidize it there. We know it's a substrate for that. And then you attach something that makes this whole big complex water soluble. And then it's excreted from the body, uh, probably through the feces. Well, we know it's through the feces. Okay, the leaching of NBMI mercury in solution. If you look at this, this is mercury NBMI complex and the pH 4, 6, and 10, and the amount that leached out over uh, 2, 30, and 60 days is infinitesimal. It just does not break down. So it's not going to take it to your brain and release it and have it react with your brain proteins. Just not going to happen. You have to heat this compound to over 250 degrees centigrade to have it release mercury, and, and when you do that, you destroy the whole compound. And I haven't seen a physiological system that exists at 250 degrees centigrade anyway. Okay. Removal of mercury, lead, cadmium, and copper, and iron from aqueous solutions at physiological pH. If you look at this, we remove over 99.9% .9 of it with one application of a one-to-one -one level of NBMI to the metal. So it binds all of these heavy metals, and they all come down in a precipitate, and you can try to dissolve them without any luck. I mean, they're, they're very stable uh, relative to physiological. Mercury being the one the most tightly bond and the one that's the most difficult to do this. Now, you know, I, I, I take research and I go very fast with it, but we, we tested NBMI, and I, I don't want to go over the testing. You can't inject enough into a rat to make him sick. The more you give them, the healthier they look, as long as you don't blow them apart, blow them out of their skin. But this, this is the... This is you know, as a scientist, one of the best days, you have best days of your life. This is one of my best days. We took rats, and we, we started treating them with one milligram uh, per kilogram. That was a, a, a lethal dose. And you can see on the top, I, with no treatment, they all died within 168 hours. And so we doubled it, and they were all dead within uh, uh, 24 hours. And if we treated them with NBMI, as you can see from the top, none of them died. And so then we jumped down to 14 milligrams, 14 times a lethal dose, A second, I got a blockade here. A welcome to the high end. Uh, but if you look at the bottom on there, without, without treatment, if we gave them 14 times a lethal dose, they were all dead within uh, before 12 hours came up. And if we treated them with the uh, NBMI one time, we saved 67 percent of them forever, and we saved many of them out for 48 hours. So NBMI is very effective at binding mercury and rendering it non-toxic. Now when you look at that, if you're a reasonable man, you would say, hey, this stuff works. If we're going to treat people that are mercury toxic, we don't need to go back and do $15 million worth of uh, trite studies to see if it does anything to the heart rhythm, etc. I've done all of them. Uh, so the compound works. And this is a 90-day study given of the excretion. I'll tell you about this. It's there. You can read it if you get the thing. And what we did, we looked at, we took rats, uh, at least enough to do uh, 16 per group, and we treated them, and we measured. We gave them a, a day for the mercury to get into their body with and without NBMI present, and we wanted to see what happened to the little bit that was in there. This is not enough to kill them, even make them sick, actually. They didn't lose weight uh, very much. 
So you see that there is a certain amount of like 30,000, 25 to 30,000 uh, micrograms per gram in the kidney. And at day 30, it was mostly gone. At day 60, it was there. And at day 89, there's a little bit left, but not very much. Most of it is going out of the body. Now, if we look at the liver, NBMI, mercury complex went into the liver a bit more because that's where it goes to get removed. And you can see that at, by day 30, it's mostly gone. Day 60, it is gone. Day 89, there was nothing. And in the brain, the same thing. It starts out higher because it's lipophilic, and but it traps it. And at day 30, it's down there. And at day 60, it's all gone. So when people tell you NBMI might build up the mercury in your body because it binds so tightly, they don't. They haven't done the experiments. We have. It doesn't. Your body will get rid of all of it. It did in this particular study. Okay. Let's see. This is a study of, on the mercury toxic miners in Ecuador, and I, I'm going to, I know I don't have a lot of time left, so I want to get to this. If you look at the center thing, this is the level of mercury. The very start of that curve was where they were when we first addressed them. They took the NBMI for two weeks, and the bottom was where it dropped. These people still went back to work. These are the people that take a blowtorch and heat gold and mercury mixtures and breathe the mercury as it comes off. I mean, they have really high levels. They look at the level over uh, close to 350 micrograms per uh, liter of urine. Uh, the one on the left is where we just gave 100 milligrams, and uh, to the right is the placebo, and you see they're going up and down. But there's a lot of variation in these people because this is done in Zaruma, Ecuador, and the whole town is mercury toxic, according to most people, because people are constantly burning mercury off of gold. And But anyway, you can see that... The, the massive drops in the center one, which is the 300 milligrams of mercury, uh, uh, pardon me, NBMI treatment. And if we go back and look at the data, again, if you look at the center on the red numbers, on the ones that got 300 milligrams in the center, uh, nine, 10 out of 11 showed major drops. The one that didn't went up eight tenths of a microgram because he was low to start with. So it's really a non-significant change. Uh, in the uh, bottom one, which is the placebo group, it's about 50-50. Some of them went up, some of them went down. It's hard to do a mercury level in somebody who's constantly going out, uh, exposing themselves to high levels of mercury. But we did it and uh, the results are, are very effective. This is the essential metals, copper, iron, and zinc, and you can see that they didn't change dramatically from each other. They're quite different from the reference level because these people are extremely mercury toxic. But we didn't see any depletion of any of the metals in this study as we didn't see in the phase one study. On the placebo effect, <clears throat> we'll see here that uh, fatigue scores, I'm not good at this kind of research. I don't do research on asking people how well you feel and say they tell you the truth from week one to week two to week three. But the uh, CRO group with us says this is very dramatic, that we saw a tremendous decrease in the fatigue level of these mercury toxic miners that took, especially those that took the 200. And the bottom one is a placebo. Uh, they didn't change at all. Okay, this is the question a lot of people want to know. Can we give this to firefighters and military men? Uh, people that are going to go into dangerous areas, like into gold mining, if you're going to go someplace where you know there's a lot of mercury around, can you take mercury, uh, MBMI pretreatment and do this? And this was done by uh, Dr. Ragnar, uh, uh, pardon me, Klingberger, uh, uh, Ragnar Klingberger, and he's our CEO, and he uh, designed this study, and he gave rats NBMI, and then some days later he gave them, had, had the people, he didn't do it, he hired somebody to do it, uh, gave them lethal doses of mercury. And what we found is that, similar to what we did, uh, if you didn't give them the NBMI, they all died. They all died very quickly, as you can see on the days there, from day three to four, that's when they were given the mercury, they were dead. If you gave them NBMI, uh, four of them didn't die at all, and some of the others died. And now we looked at them, we, we can't do this with humans, but we took the rats, cut their heads off, pulled out their kidneys and looked at uh, the necrosis of the tubular epithelium of the cortex of the kidney. And what you find is if you got the, uh, uh, if you were one of them that survived with NBMI, you had no alteration. If you didn't get that, you had a four level and your uh, kidneys were dramatically uh, modified. Now here's the one that I think is the 
the best experiment, and Dr. I mean, pardon me, Ragnar Klingberg did this in Sweden. That eagle lying there was picked up by people. In Sweden, they have feeding stations for predator birds. In the wintertime, when things are really tough, they will go there and put out fish for these birds to eat. And so when they get sick and they can't eat and they get hungry and they're not wild enough or active enough, they go there and they go there to die. They know, I mean, you know they're going to die because they find them dead there all the time. They're the sick birds that come in there when they can still fly and then they slowly can't. And people pick them up and take them into this one veterinarian who tries to save them without any luck until NBMI. This eagle was picked up on January 2015, found paralyzed. I mean, you wouldn't pick up an eagle if he were healthy. I mean, you know that. Uh, anyway, he had 989 micrograms of mercury. That's 66 times the action level of mercury in the EU. 15 micrograms, and you go to the hospital for uh, chelation and uh, everything else. So they had to gavage the NBMI down this eagle for five days. 120 milli uh, 1,200 milligrams of NBMI, and then he started eating. He'd eat one rat a day, just like you see him sitting there, but he still couldn't stand up. But with time, um, you see him off to the right. He got up on the, he started playing around the cage and he started tearing the cage apart. So they let him out. And he flew up on a tree, sat there for a while and flew away. So he, I mean, you can't do this. Now what does this tell you? It tells you NBMI is not toxic to uh, predator birds. Not toxic at all. Uh, it can reach all of the intracellular and central nervous system areas where mercury goes in and causes problems. This eagle was close to death. As far, close as gets. So whatever we, whatever you're going to treat him with that's going to bring him back so he can get up and fly away is going to have to get into the mitochondria because if, with that level of mercury in your body, there's no way of keeping the mercury out of the mitochondria. No way, in my opinion. And we can say NBMI works quite rapidly to bring birds back to good health. And uh, I, I think this is one of the most telling of the experiments that we've done. And we've done this on uh, eagle owls and other birds that eat uh, fish. Now, this comes back to the nutrition. This eagle ate what eagles eat, which is fish float, uh, swimming around the lake. He didn't go out and, you know, take vaccinations or have dental amalgam fillings. And, and you, you're not either, I'm telling you. We've all got to worry about the level of toxicity in our countries, all of our countries. And we need to work together on this. And we, you know, I'm not in the blame game, I'm in the solving problems game. And when we look at this, we say, uh, yes, I mean, trust me, I've had major health problems in the last three years. I made it to 72 without anything going with me. And in 73, the wheels came off because I was a big meat eater. You know, you heard of meat and potato guys? I was just one of these many, many meat guys, and my arteries suffered from it. So there's a lot about medicine that I don't know, but I've changed my diet, and now my clogged arteries are no longer clogged. Uh, but it wasn't NBMI that did that, it was the diet, and my, my wife's good at cooking and taking care of me. So uh, I hope you go, people don't think I'm saying, I'm just saying NBMI is going to cure all the problems in the world. This is important considerations, how I started to talk out, and with all the stuff that's down behind it, uh, the answers. NBMI is an exceptional compound, and I'm sitting here telling you, even if the FDA doesn't approve it, it's going to change medicine, because the Chinese don't care what the FDA does. So they can, buy, they can buy this stuff from me or they can buy it from some Chinese supplier. That's what the choice is right now. You do not get help from our government if you have something like this to solve a problem. Not by gently telling them. Now maybe if I torch something, they'd come and listen to me and put me in jail and then let, put these... But, but it does everything that I said something has to do to reverse heavy metal toxicity from things such as cadmium and uh, mercury. This is uh, going back to what uh, Dr. Levy was talking about. He and I are in total agreement. I just go a step further and say what causes, what is the chemistry of the oxidative stress and the glutathione levels. And uh, here's a, something you should read this. This is about apoptosis and glutathione. Glutathione does a lot for your body. It regulates when you do need to kill cells. You can convert glutathione to uh, ox oxidized glutathione, and it will cause those cells to die when they need to die. I mean, when you need to get rid of them. So it's not all that simple. But here is a study done by myself and Dr. Perinati at Ohio State University. We have control cells. The blue are the control 
and a red get NBMI, and you see even in the control cells with no toxin added, if you add NBMI, the amount of glutathione in the cell goes up almost double. So we're operating at a, at a, a low level, even when we're not toxic. If you add methylmercury, the second one, or thimerosal from the vaccines in the uh, next one, you see that the level drops off dramatically and that NBMI prevents that. It does that by simply chelating the mercury in thimerosal and uh, methylmercury. And it prevents it from depleting your body of reduced glutathione. Now, for old people in the room, the reason this is important is that as we age, our glutathione levels stay up very high for a long time. But when you hit something, depending upon how healthy you are, in your 40s, 50s, your glutathione levels start dropping. And when you're my age, and I'm 70, I'll be 77 this year, your glutathione levels are almost in the toilet. And that's the reason flu and other infections get you because you have no fight back. You have no redox system to fight. And trust me, glutathione has a lot to do with preventing viruses from spreading in your body. And so when I started taking NBMI, I had myself tested. And I was in my late 60s at that time. And the doctor was floored. He said, we don't test glutathione levels very often. And I had to tell him where to go get it tested. He said, because we can't do anything about it. But when he looked at my thing, I had, I had glutathione levels that were those of maybe a teenager. And that's because I take NBMI every day. And if you think, I mean, I'm a little crazy, I'll agree with that, but, uh, but I'm healthy. And here's a, here's a study we did on food, uh, it's called a food safety study, on 72-year-olds, 70-year-old people. And you look at the start of it, at the baseline, each one of these people, and then the, the third one over on each one of the groups is after taking NBMI for a period of time. And you see that each one of them had a dramatic increase in reduced glutathione levels and total glutathione levels. And that is essential if you want to get older people to be healthy. So this compound does that. That's the reason I sold it as an antioxidant. The data is all there. And when the FDA decided to shut me down, they didn't ask me if I was right or wrong. They didn't give a damn. Right or wrong, I didn't do it their way. So you get, you get shut down. And for those of you that want a comparison, this is an ORAC score. Oxygen radical absorbance capacity. You send it off to have it done. There's a company that does this, several companies that do this. And you can see that NBMI has a, an average score of about 192,400. And uh, I can read the same dark chocolate, pomegranate, and things like that are the ones below it. They're not even close. And not only that, things like Reversitol, they look nice, but they get excreted out of the blood so fast, they never get in the cells and they never do the job. This compound goes into the cells, stays there for 22 hours, half light, and it scavenges hydroxy free radicals. And uh, I've been told to wrap it up. So I just, I just want to do one, one more thing. And this is the treatment we're doing with NBMI binding free arm. Because a lot of illnesses that we have running around the country, they say, I mean, like thalassemia or iron overload diseases, you have too much free iron. How do you get too much free iron? Your, your intestines won't let it through unless you have an intestinal uh, bleeding. And what we've done here uh, is to uh, take, um, this, the bowel here is not British anti-leucide agent. Bowel here is bronchoalveolar lavage cells that we've, they've taken out of the lungs of people with COPD or having breathing problems. And then you add a little bit of iron to it to see, is there something in there that makes oxidative stress? And um, <clears throat> the first one you see, the orange, that's with nothing added. And if you add a little bit of FE, uh, uh, if you add uh, DTPA, which is a very good chelator of metals, except that it kills you. It's sort of like a, a super, a super EDTA. It has an extra carboxylate group on it. It totally blocks it. If you add EDTA, and here's the problem. If, if you're a person treating somebody with iron overload with EDTA, if you hold that iron, like in my hand here with EDTA, there's still this face where the electrons can be exchanged in a fin reaction and you can produce hydroxy-free radicals. As a matter of fact, according to this data, you can do it better. EDTA absolutely increases the toxicity of a small amount of iron by chelating it and uh, rearranging the electrons. And you see the outside right one is NBMI, and NBMI totally blocks it with no toxic effects. And I'll quit there because if I don't, he's going to hit me with that microphone.